Our author, Tim Wendell, is a writer of nonfiction, novels, and narrative fiction. He's a writer in residence at John Hopkins University where he teaches fiction and nonfiction writing. His work appears with some regularity in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, USA Weekend, Washingtonian, the Huffington Post, GQ, Esquire, and the USA Today op-ed page. Importantly, if you're a baseball buff, you know that Tim is a founding editor of the USA Today Baseball Weekly. Tim writes great books about baseball and people who play the game and watch the game and know the game. His ninth book, The Summer of 68, the season when baseball and America changed forever, was about the St. Louis Cardinals versus Detroit Tigers World Series and the events of 1968. It's an awesome read and it was a Publishers Weekly Top 10 selection in 2012. High Heat, The Secret History of the Fastball and the Improbable Search for the Fastest Pitcher of All Time was not about Sid Finch. Uh, ah, good, somebody remembers that story, that's good. Okay, uh, that was an editor's selection by the New York Times Book Review. And The New Face of Baseball was named a top history book for 2004 by the Latino Literary Council. Any avid baseball fan should have all of these titles on their reading list. Now, Tim's latest work is about the 1991 World Series between Minnesota Twins and the Atlanta Braves, the worst to first for both teams to the National and American League Championship and then to the World Series. The series was notable for having three extra inning games, including game seven, four games ending with walk-off runs. And I have to admit, I was living in St. Louis at the time, a diehard Cardinals fan. I wasn't a fan of either team. <laughs> and I've suppressed memories of the series. The Twins had defeated the Cards in 87 in that awful stadium, and I couldn't stand that Ted Turner made the Braves America's team, and the Tomahawk chop was just obnoxious and still is. But this was a series for a baseball fan, and I watched every game. I think I watched every game. Game seven alone was astounding and epic, as every game seven should be. Like the summer of 68, Tim writes about more than just the games and the game action. He's a compelling storyteller, and this book is full of stories that converge on a moment in the game during a key play or a hit or a run. The perspective of what happens in the clubhouse, the dugout, and on the field during a 162-game season sets up what happens in those seven games. And it doesn't matter that you already know the outcome of this World Series. It's the backstories that have hooked me into Tim's work uh, and, and this book as well. The main characters are not just the players, the teams, the coaches, the owners and fans, they're even the cities and the, and the stadiums. So I'm very excited to have Tim back at the uh, Gaithersburg Book Festival. Please join me in welcoming Tim Wendell and his discussion of Down to the Last Pitch, how the 1991 Minnesota Twins and Atlanta Braves gave us the best World Series of all time. And we can debate that later. <laughs> all right, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for coming out. Wow, I'm beginning to wish I brought a jacket. I'm freezing up here. <laughs> anyway, thank you. It's great to be back in Gaither's Book Festival, a great venue and one I try to hit when I have a new book out. Um, we've got some slides up here which will kind of address a little bit, which maybe will help the storytelling. Um, it was sometime during the 1991 series that Roger Angel from the New Yorker leaned over to me, and we could hardly hear each other think uh, in both venues, either in the Metrodome or in the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. And he leaned over and he said, what is that song? You could tell he didn't like the song, but Roger being Roger, he was gonna be thorough, he was gonna be part of his New Yorker thing that was gonna be out later. And I knew the song. And the song went, I'm sorry, I'm going to put this in your memory banks now for the rest of the day. It'll be okay. But it went, da 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 hey, da 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 And I went, Roger, I think I know. And I said, I'm pretty sure the artist is Gary Glitter, who is right up there somewhere. And the, sh the song is Rock and Roll Part Two. I was right. And a couple weeks later, when Roger's always great opus piece came out, I was mentioned as his, and my young friend told me this was Gary Glitter and Rock and Roll Part Two. Um, I kind of bring that up because it kind of typifies a little bit of the series. It had a little bit of everything. It was crazy. You had two venues that have since been leveled. Uh, the Metrodome, which I was going by, what's left of it, the big hole in the ground the other day, 
uh, up in Minneapolis, uh, I get kind of misty-eyed about. Few do. Uh, I was like, <laughs> decibel readings went past the, like 128. They figured out after the first game of the 1991 series, they had to take the bullpen phones off the wall and put them down on the floor on the AstroTurf, and the bullpen coaches would have their foot on top of it because that's the only way they knew a call to the bullpen was coming. The vibrations came up through their foot because if they waited to hear it, they were missing too many calls from the bullpen. As Mike pointed out, this was uh, the first teams to go worst to first. Red Sox did it obviously last year. This is still the first and only time you had two teams that did it in the same year. And let's focus on those teams a little bit. One of them, <laughs> Minnesota Twins, with Tom Kelly as the manager. Uh, finished, I forgot what it says up here, I think 29 games out of first place the year before. The Oakland A's were pretty much supposed to be the, the team to beat in the American League. But about halfway through the season, the A's went on a winning streak, 15 games. Among that was uh, beating the A's several times, and they became, in essence, the team coming out of the AL West. They also beat arguably a better team in the playoffs in the American League that year in the division championship series. They beat the Toronto Blue Jays, who will go on to win back-to-back -back championships in 92 and 93. One of the things I find interesting, we're going to get into it a little bit, is there's a real lack of patience, I think, right now in sports and also corporate America. One, I think, one of the best moves the Blue Jays ever did, and I had long conversations with Pat Gillick, the GM, about it. Oh, wait, wait just a minute, maybe for the train. Here it comes. Um, Pat Gillick. <laughs> That's a water break. Pat Gillick was urged to, in a sense, make big trades and fire his manager after losing to the Twins. Instead, he decided to Stan Pat, hence the nickname Stan Pat Gillick, and they went on to win back-to-back -back championships. Uh, he feels that's one of the best moves he ever did, was not making a move. Now, the team that they end up playing in 1991 World Series, the Atlanta Braves. Longtime manager Bobby Cox, finished 26 games, I believe, out of first place the year before. Started to rally a bit with some great young arms and Glavin and Smoltz, et cetera. Guys that had traded um, Dale Murphy a couple years before and David Justice was filling in and Ron Gant. One of the things I find amazing about with this team, and I think one reason the Braves have done so well, is that they were able to kind of admit their mistakes and try to make the best of it. Bobby Cox, we'll see here, is the manager. Bobby Cox had already had a run with the Braves. He'd been fired. And one of the great lines, I think, ever from a press conference, Ted Turner was asked at the press conference where they, after they had fired Bobby Cox the first time, and he had gone on to Toronto, helped build up that club, and helped put Pat, Pat Gillick on the map. They asked Ted Turner, what kind of guy are you looking now to replace Bobby Cox? And Ted Turner's quote is classic. He said, well, we could really use a guy like Bobby Cox, but I just fired him. Three years later, they brought him back when they made this series. Now, one of the things Mike alluded to, and I love about baseball, and it's fun to write about, is 1991, obviously, is this epic World Series, which we're going to get into. But there's a lot of other things swirling around, which I really enjoy. 1991 is the year Pete Rose is banished from the game. And we can may go down that road if you really want to. We'll be here all day. It's also the year where Roger Maris has the asterisk removed from his single season home run record, which I still feel maybe should be the record. One of the things as I got deeper into the early 90s, it's this sweet spot in time when it comes to the national pastime. I just alluded to it a little bit, but we have yet to have an entire generation of players tarnished by steroids and PEDs. Also, money was not that huge at that point in time. Anybody want to take a guess who had one of the highest team payrolls in 1991? Oakland Athletics, who will go on soon to become the poster child for Moneyball, hence an acknowledgement that they didn't have, have the money to compete. One of the things that's going on in baseball, and it's going on throughout corporate America, too, 
is that family-owned corporations are going the way of extinction and they're being taken over by corporations. What's the big deal? I think family-owned have much more, in a sense, patience. The athletics were much more family-owned at that point in time. What you started to hear disappearing from the vocabulary was the word rebuild. We don't rebuild anymore. We retool, we do it quickly, and if somebody can't do it, then they're fired. One of the things I found interesting in talking with guys like Dallas Green, the late Sid Thrift, not Sid Finch, and we can get into him later if you want, um, was it used to be baseball was like the company kind of store or company factory. If you got in early, kept your nose clean, was promoted up throughout, you would probably retire from there. You'd probably retire with a gold watch, maybe in baseball, or retire with a couple championship rings. Joe Torre is one of the first, the first ones to figure this out. Joe Torre in 1991 is pretty much with the St. Louis Cardinals. He is yet to going to be good enough to have his number retired by the Yankees, um, which he'll have here soon. He's the one, we had a conversation, he said, it didn't matter what I had done. It didn't matter that maybe I had the ball team set up for the future. If we didn't win right now, I was going to be fired. And I think that's kind of the world we still live in, and baseball has experienced it. Another one of the stories, which is interesting, kind of happened just up the road from here, is in 1991, we also had the first athlete in one of the four major sports to die of AIDS. It was Alan Wiggins, who was playing just up the road for the Baltimore Orioles. One of the characters in Down to the Last Pitch is his daughter, Candace who is now uh, in the WNBA. She was an All-American basketball player at Stanford. One of her earliest memories is of her father's funeral when she was three out in California. And back then, the belief was you could get this strange disease, new disease, AIDS, simply by breathing it. And in essence, uh, her father was one of the, I think, one of the guys really overlooked. And if you look at it just from a medical standpoint, and I'm not going to belabor this, but early on in 1991, her father dies. We finished 1991 with Magic Johnson saying, I'm positive for HIV. And yet Magic Johnson obviously is still with us. Hence, that's one reason why Candace, who's a little daughter in that photograph, why she took up basketball. Oops. The A's. The A's were the team to beat. And we're going to touch on them just briefly. Uh, they were also where things were starting to go. You'll see on the left-hand side, ah, there's the poster child for steroids. It's Jose Canseco, who they were starting to shoot up in the, in the A's clubhouse. I, I first covered the A's back in the late 80s. I had no idea any of this was going on. You also had, in a sense, Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan. They started to, in a sense, put together how bullpens are done these days. You, in a sense, go lefty-lefty, left-handed reliever pitching against a left-handed pitcher, righty-righty. You build on up to a preeminent closer like Dennis Eckersley, and this is the way it's done. We somehow think this has been going on forever. This has hardly been going on, it's, it hasn't been going on 25 years. I was covering the A's when Eckersley, in a sense, was being moved from the starting rotation to being the closer. He fought it tooth and nail. He didn't want it to happen. I remember him telling me at one point, they're moving me, I think they're moving me to the bullpen because they don't think I'm a good enough pitcher anymore. Yet, it put him in the Hall of Fame. You also had a preeminent player there with Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson never did steroids. Ricky Henderson had a great line though. He found out later that Conseco, McGuire, et cetera, were kind of shooting up and he kind of said, they didn't, they didn't let me in on it. Can you imagine Ricky on roids? Wow. So, but we also have in 1991, I alluded to it a little bit, how the business end changed. You had a record, 14 managers fired that year, still the record. And in a sense, it was kind of part of do it now or you're being shown the door. Here's one of the guys who probably shouldn't have lost his job, Jim Lefevre, who led the Seattle Mariners to a winning record, their first winning record for that, for finishing runner up to the A's and the Twins. He was fired. I talked to his son a little while ago, Ryan Lefevre, who's the voice of the Kansas City Royals, and Ryan said that job is the one that still sticks with his dad. He's going, that's the one he feels it was the most unfair to be fired from. 
Ah, the Braves. <laughs> now, one of the things, you got Tom Glavin, who starts coming on in 91, becomes a Cy Young Award winner. You also have, in essence, um, Ted Turner, who is the owner, and I talked to you just a little bit earlier about what he had to say about Bobby Cox. He saw the error of his ways and brought Cox back. One of the things I find amazing about Turner buying the Braves is he didn't have enough money to buy them at that point in time. In a sense, they were asking a lofty asking price of about $20,000. Can you imagine that now, what we pay for, uh, for franchises? He didn't have it, though. He didn't really have it. He said, why don't I put some down, and I'll give you the rest later if we really make this work. And the powers of being baseball said, OK. So we'll give it a shot, in part because they didn't want to move the Braves again. The Braves had been in Boston, they'd been in Milwaukee, they were in Atlanta, they wanted to keep them in Atlanta. Turner was one of the few people to kind of recognize that the Southeast was, in a sense, kind of virgin territory for baseball, Major League Baseball. We'd had the big epic move out west with the Dodgers and the Giants about a generation before. Nobody had really started to make the Southeast a major regional market. The other part of brilliance with uh, Ted Turner, he was, he had his superstation before it was a superstation, and he had, in a sense, it was being sent out via satellite around local markets around the Atlanta area and a little bit farther out. It was being done by satellite. Uh, he got talking with some of the satellite folks and they said, well, you know, for what we're charging you to beam it off a satellite and just have it kind of in the Atlanta, Georgia area, for about the same amount of money, we can do it nationally. And he said, well, let's do it. Hence, the Braves become America's team. And you had the, Bra uh, the Twins, um, eclectic bunch of guys. They had one in 87, which Mike talked about. Um, I remember the quote that, I don't know, da, uh, Dan Cusenberry said after that series, he said, I don't really believe in uh, uh, nuclear annihilation, but in the case of this place, meaning the me Metrodome, I maybe can have a reason for it. <laughs> um, among their stars, you had Brian Harper, who had been pretty much, by the time he reached the Twins, this was his eighth team. All he was looking for was a part-time job. In a sense, keep going, maybe get a pension in baseball. In essence, he becomes the starting catcher for this team and a pretty good rotation, which we'll get into in a little bit. The other guy had been a longtime hometown hero, Ken Herbeck. Herbeck grew up in Bloomington, Minnesota, could see the lights of the old stadium, the place before the Metrodome, uh, from his bedroom window. This was before scouting really took off. He was pretty much scouted by one guy in the Minnesota area who was pretty much told the Twins, I'm sure this guy is first round talent. And nobody else had heard of him. They drafted him in the first round and he finished runner up to Cal Ripken his rookie year for that award. Another thing starts to happen, 1991. And it kind of happens just down the road from here. 1991, you had, in a sense, we're on the verge of the new era of ballparks. Uh, we'd had a number of new ones go up, like Sky Dome, which uh, maybe is a little too much. You had a couple new ones with uh, the, uh, uh, the new one in Chicago, had new ones in Kansas City. But as the 91 series is happening and coming to a close, just down the road in Baltimore, they are racing to make deadlines so that they can open up their new ballpark Camden Yards to start the 1992 season. Of course, they make it, and I think that starts, in essence, the whole wave of ballparks that we have now, which ironically has come back to Target Field with Minnesota being one of the latest ones. One of the things that I think helped underscore that was we had such an epic series, and they were kind of played in very strange places. Metrodome, you had a Teflon-colored roof where you lost the ball all the time, asked Lonnie Smith. You had, in a sense, a baggy, a hefty bag in right field for the fence. You had plexiglass above the center field fence. You know, Kirby Puckett making a great grab against the plexiglass. Atlanta Fulton County wasn't that much better. Kind of a pit, kind of a multi-purpose place. And I think there was this understanding a little bit among people, just baseball fans, watching this amazing series and going, 
boy, these are strange places we're seeing these games in. And then the next year, here comes Camden. One story about Camden that you can tell your grandkids about. Larry Lucchino one time, and he knows I'm a big Camden Yards fan, he said, you want to see the, the original blueprints for Camden Yards? Said, yeah, let's take a look. This is what he was doing with the Orioles. He pulled them out. Original blueprints for Camden Yards. That famous warehouse, it was leveled. There was so much surface parking around that extended past Russell Street on one side and went into Federal Hill on the other. It looked like kind of Kansas City ballpark plopped down in the Inner Harbor. One thing we can thank our lucky stars, the Orioles did, is they hired a person that I think has been one of the most overlooked individuals and certainly one of the most overlooked women in baseball in the last quarter century, Janet Marie Smith. Architecture, PhD out of Mississippi State. They brought her in after looking at these blueprints going, oh my God, and this is from HOK, who you know loves to pat itself on the back for being the great architect of the urban ballpark. They brought in Janet Marie and they said, you have to push back against this. She became their point person and a large part of what Camden Yards is today is because of her. Even when you sit down in the box seats, take a look, a little bit of that ball player, that insignia on the seat side, that's Wee Willie Keeler. That was her idea to do that. The series, as Mike talked about, five games decided by one run. Four games are walk-off fashion. Three games, including game seven, go to extra innings. I think in a lot of ways, this, it, it, it still is one of the highest rated World Series of all times which if you ask TV executives is impossible. This is two small markets. This shouldn't work. Where's the big market? But people got so sucked into this. And talking with the players on both sides, they said it was like being trapped, enmeshed, embedded in like a great movie or a great film. You didn't know what was gonna happen, but each night it kind of started topping what had gone before. Scott Leas told me of the third baseman for the Twins, he said, the only way I got through this series without losing my mind was I just concentrated on the next pitch, the next play, do what I needed to do. Because if I stopped and suddenly listened to the crowd, which were loud in both places, realized how crazy this series was becoming, it would have been over for me. I would have made error after error. Um, certainly we can argue best series of all time. You know, I, I'm arguing this is the best, but certainly it's on a short list with 75. You know, Carlton Fisk is certainly on a short series with, I don't know, maybe Kirk Gibson with Hormanoff Eckersley. Um, I think you can argue maybe the one after 9-11 between the Diamondbacks and the Yankees for sure. But it's for sure on this short list of all time, in part because you had two improbable teams, but you also had two, in a sense, uh, a, a series, a Game 7 series, that just played out better and better. Now let's talk about some of those. Um, looked like the Twins had it. They won the first two at home rather handily for whatever this series was going to break out. But Bobby Cox, as things were shifting to Game 3, 4, 5, it was Games 1, 2 in Minnesota, 3, 4, 5 in Atlanta, going back for 6, 7 in back up at the Metrodome. Bobby Cox hinted, okay, we may be down 0-2, but they gotta come to our place. And as we, this is kind of the start of the Tomahawk Chop. Sorry, I just embedded that in your head again, too. <laughs> and one of the weirdest shots I saw in doing this, um, put it in the book, we have President, former President Jimmy Carter, Jane Fonda and Ted Turner, all in the front row of the owner's seats, wearing Braves hat, doing the Tomahawk Chop, and you go, Oh, something's wrong with that picture. <laughs> um, they come on with a guy named, in part, large part, Mark Lemke, nicknamed Dirt. You gotta love a guy nicknamed Dirt, don't you? Um, Andy Van Slyke, who grew up near Lemke in Utica, New York, said it's a real crime that Lemke never hit as well in the regular season as he did in the postseason. He could have made some real good money. But Lemke comes on, he singles in, he drives in the winning run in game three, scores the winning run in game four, and all of a sudden we've got a series. Now, the Braves were a very young team. One of the things that we think has gone on forever in baseball is rally caps. Not so much. 
but kind of go back maybe about this far, maybe a smidge farther. But if any team ever brought rally caps to an art form, it was the Braves. They had five or six different kind of combinations or ones they would do. Depending upon what was going on in the game, Steve Avery, who was kind of impersonating Sandy Koufax in this series, would in a sense say, okay, we're doing the bonnet cap, we're doing the bucket cap, or their favorite, the shark cap, which they would turn the cap sideways so the, in a sense the bill looked like a dorsal fin. They would do the shark cap when there was blood in the water and they were rallying late in games. You can see in this shot here, the pitchers were really into it. David Justice may not so much, but the pitchers were totally into it and they had it totally down. They practiced their rally cap formations before games. So when it kind of rolled out, they were ready to go. So I still think the ultimate rally cap team is the Braves. Uh, Kirby Puck. If anybody makes this a great series, it's probably Kirby Puckett. Kirby Puckett wins uh, game six that the Braves arguably should have won. Arguably the Braves should have won the series. Uh, Puckett's homer in the bottom of the 11th, um, in a sense, propels the Twins onto a game seven. But one of the things I love about Puckett, a couple stories on Puckett. Rick Aguilera joined the Twins from the Mets became part of this really representative pitching staff that they had. And he tells a story about um, coming to the Twins and showing up, and, he was at, and the Twins were playing at the old Yankee Stadium. We may have another water break coming here in a minute. And he showed up, put on his uniform. The game was already going. He walked down to the dugout in old Yankee Stadium. <laughs> I love this. I grew up near a railroad track, and this is, I'm having flashbacks right now. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Aguilar is in uniform, walks down, game's already started. He walks down, he's in the visiting dugout at Yankee Stadium. Nobody really has noticed he's there. And up to bat is Puckett. Puck, there's a couple guys on. Twins are behind. Puckett grounds out, makes an out, doesn't drive him in. He's coming back to the dugout very, very upset. Now, he's not throwing things, but obviously he's upset. And all of a sudden, Puckett looks up, and he sees Ricky Aguilera. And they had never really met, but Puckett knew who Aguilera was. And he comes down, he suddenly has a big smile on his face, comes down the dugout steps. Everybody kind of knows, oh, oh the new guy's here. And Aguilera, uh, uh, Puckett wraps him up in big air, uh, bear hug, and he tells Aguilera, whispers in his ear, Aggie. He's already calling him Aggie. He says, Aggie, you're going to love it here. You're going to love this team. And Aguilera's going, I've been with this team five minutes. I'm ready to run through a wall for this guy. Now, one of the things Puckett did very well is he kept everything very loose. One of the things I loved about Puckett, one of the great stories, is they had a clubhouse kid with the old twins called Little Snoop. Now, Little Snoop had a pretty big afro. And Puckett would always kind of be looking at this afro, and this went on for a while. And finally, one day, he went to Little Snoop, and he said, I'll give you 600 bucks if we can shave your afro. Little Snoop said, no, not shaving my afro. Now, Puckett wouldn't have let it go. Puckett got his hat, started handing it around the clubhouse, getting money. We're up to 650, 700, 750, 800, 825. Little Snoop bites. He says, all right, for 825, I'll, sh I'll shave my afro. So they rig up the electric clippers. And they put little Snoop there right in front of a mirror. And the, the first swipe, because it's Puckett's idea, has got to go to Puckett. Goes right down the middle. And then he kind of pretends something's wrong with the clippers. He goes, they broke, something's wrong. And you know, they actually pulled it out of the wall. And they sit in there, and Puckett's going, oh, man, you're going to have to go home like this, little Snoop, because, you know, the clippers broke. And little Snoop just looking in the mirror going, my mama's going to kill me. <laughs> but that was Puckett. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this great home run. Because one of the reasons I love writing these books is sometimes you find out, in essence, what Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. Legend has it that in game six, we're 3-3, three, three, bottom of the 11th. Kirby Puckett tells his teammates, he's the first one due up in that inning. I'm going to go up and hit a home run, and we're going to go on to game seven. That's legend. One of the things I 
was looking at, and I watched a lot of footage for these games, was before Puckett's epic at bat, he and Chili Davis are talking a lot. Chili Davis is going to be in the on-deck circle. Chili Davis is the second one due up that inning. Now, I knew Chili somewhat from my days covering games in San Francisco. He used to be with the Giants. I used to cover the Giants as a way back. Games at Candlestick, where the wind would be blowing all over the place, flags blowing one way, and then right next, next to him, blowing down a different way. And I interviewed, one of the first interviews I did for this book was with Chili out in Oakland. He's now the hitting instructor out there. And we're just talking about the series. He's talking about some stuff. And finally, I say, what were you and Puckett talking about before that game six home run? And I love Chili. He got this kind of sly grin on his face. He said, you really want to know? And I said, Chili, I'm here. Tell me. And so Chili starts this story that he said what we were arguing or discussing, heatedly discussing, was Puckett's idea was he was going to bunt. He was going to bunt his way on steal second, and I was going to hit him in. All right? And, and I said, Chili, what would you think when Puckett told you this? And he said, he said, Puck, I think it's a bad idea. And so what you see on tape is actually Chili Davis arguing Kirby Puckett out of bunting. And one reason Puckett wanted the bunt was the guy on the mound for the Braves is poor Charlie Liebrand, who becomes a whipping child for this whole series. Everything bad happens to the Braves, except for Lonnie Smith. It seems to happen with with Charlie Liebrandt. And Charlie Liebrandt threw kind of slow, change up stuff, kind of slop, and Puckett didn't hit it that well. Hence, he wanted to bunt. Davis talks him out of it. He says, not only are you going to have to wait him out, you're going to have to get a ball a little bit up in the zone so you can do something with. The first pitch to Puckett, and Ed Montague is the home plate umpire, comes in maybe, maybe knee high. I've watched the footage of this over and over. And Ed Montague calls strike one. Chili Davis in the on deck circle going, uh-oh, maybe I gave him the wrong advice. And he starts yelling out to Puckett, if you get another one like that, swing. Puckett never hears him because everybody's cheering so much. It's like the bullpen phones nobody can hear. So Puckett, uncharacteristically, starts to wait Montague out, wait uh, Lee Brand out. Next one comes across, Montague actually calls it a ball, even though it looks almost the same. Gets to a 2-1 count, and Puckett hits it. Now, one thing you'll notice on the video of that, the footage, is Puckett is running pretty hard out of the batter's box. And Chili Davis can't believe it. Number one, his friend has waited Charlie Lee Brand out. Number two, he didn't decide to butt and panic. He decided to try to hit it out. But one reason Puckett's running so hard is he's not sure if the ball is going to carry. One reason he's not sure, and one of the things I kind of discovered in my book, and I kind of remembered this a little bit from research, there used to be a couple big fans behind home plate. When the Twins were up, and they, were, they would be on. And they were on when Puckett was up. Terry Pendleton remembers this. And as Terry Pendleton remembers, he said, those fans, he said something else about those fans, those fans were on when Puckett was up. Those, throw in another expletive if you want, were never on when I was up. So one reason Puckett maybe was running was he maybe wasn't sure if the fans inside the Metrodome were up that, or on that evening. Now, one thing I love about this, and we'll open up for questions in just a sec, is um, there's a lot of game, great game sixes. That's Fisk, uh, Buckner's errors of game six, etc. One thing that's amazing about this series is you take Puckett's home run, which I think ranks right up there with Fisk and all these other great homers, but game seven arguably is better. You have one of these amazing kind of Freudian showdowns. John Smoltz going against Jack Morris. Jack Morris, let's just say, is a kind of cantankerous guy. A lot of guys have something inscribed inside the bill of their cap because you'll put it down when you're going up to bat. You'll put it down when you're in the dugout. And it could be your number, and maybe something you like to say, something inspirational. Let's just say Jack Morris's, all, the only inscription he had was A. And the, I'll just say A, as we say in the book, was for derriere. So um, that kind of summed up Jack. And Jack's pitching, and he's pitching against John Smoltz, the guy John Smoltz grew up admiring in East Lansing, Michigan, what he, the person he would pretend to be pitching the ball out against the brick wall near his uh, garage was his Tiger 
favorite pitcher, Jack Morris. And here he is going toe to toe with him. Bobby Cox maybe made a mistake lifting Smoltz too soon because Smoltz was ready to go the whole distance. But in a sense, Smoltz is pulled and we end up going 10 innings and the Twins win. Now, as you guys well know, one of the things that's legend in this is after the ninth inning, Morris is well past 100 pitches at this point. Tom Kelly, the manager, comes to him and just says, hey, big guy, you've done enough. Hey, we'll go to the bullpen now. We got Aguilera, all those guys down there. And Morris says, no, not happening. And Kelly's kind of, but I'm the manager. No, I'm not coming out of this game. And Kelly kind of goes, no, really, you know, it's good. <laughs> I, I am the manager. <laughs> and one of the curious things about Kelly is he didn't, he didn't keep track of pitch counts, but he kept track of time that his pitchers were on the mound. Once it got past two hours, he started to get worried. And Morris had been out there well over two hours. So Kelly tries again. Come on, Jack. Hey, you know, we'll, we'll go to Aguilera like that. And one of the guys sitting there in the midst of all this who was great was Brian Harper, the catcher. Just kind of going, this is getting real interesting. <laughs> it got real interesting when uh, Jack Morris says something effective to Kelly. He goes, listen, old man, if you try to take this ball from me, I'm going to knock you down and go back up there and go out back out again. <laughs> At that point, Kelly kind of just paused and went down and talked to Dick Such, the pitching coach, and kind of came back. And now everybody in the dugout's waiting for this, you know, some kind of fireworks. And Kelly, to his credit, knew kind of when to back off. And Kelly's immortal words were, OK, go get him. It's only a game. And he just turned around and walked away. And, every, and, and Brian, Harper said later, you just feel the tension just diffuse. Everything was great. And now, you, years later, Morris will just say, I was just testing him, this type of thing. But whatever. But those are like, it's interesting to see two guys kind of ram heads like that. And yet, the manager's the one who diffuses it. So I'd like to open up for questions. We can do baseball. We can do whatever you guys want to do right here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, two quick questions. Uh, how do you feel about the Nationals under Matt Williams? We feel like we've been right on the brink for a few years. Do you think we're going to overcome it? Also, have you ever seen anything in baseball more intimidating than the way Dave Stewart would stare at the batter? <laughs> Let's start with the Dave Stewart one first. Uh, Gibson's there was good. But um, the funny thing, did you ever hear Dave Stewart speak at all? He had this kind of high-pitched voice. And I still remember, there's two, like, the A's were always this team that threw me. Granted, it was a team I started with way back when, when I was young and impressionable. Um, and, and one of the things that like, threw me the first time I was I ever talked to Dave Stewart, because I'd seen him in this kind of stare and all this, and he kind of says, hey, how you doing? This type of thing. And I was like, <laughs> was he kind of making fun of me or whatever it be? The other thing that threw me one time on the A's, and I should have brought this up with Ricky, Ricky Henderson's the first guy I ever interviewed who talked about himself in third person. You know, Ricky's hammies are kind of hurting today, and Ricky's feeling kind of beat up. And I, I totally threw me. I, I thought he was talking about somebody else. <laughs> but anyway, now they all talk about himself in third person. Um, Stewart was a great money pitcher. And I think, one of the, again, one of the genius moves that Duncan and La Russa did was when he came to Oakland, he was considered a journeyman at best. And they moved him quickly, not only in the starting rotation, but he was either the one or two for many, many years there. Nats, I covered Matt Williams. And I think um, as a player or with the Giants, it's going to be interesting because Matt, and I also covered him, um, gosh, I think it was with Cleveland when they lost the series to Florida to the Marlins, yeah. And, um, you know, great guy, very upfront. We're going to have a very interesting time watching this because he's old school. And let's just say we got some guys on that team who maybe aren't old school. I think in some ways Bryce Harper hurting the thumb and being out now for six, seven, whatever weeks is actually, you hate to say it, but it, it kind of takes the, the pressure, takes the intensity down a notch a little bit. Uh, it's going to be real interesting to see what happens when Harper comes back. Um, and I think as long as Rizzo, Mike Rizzo, is running the show, he really thinks the world of uh, Matt Williams. So we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. What else? What else you guys want to talk about? 
anything. Right here. What's your favorite baseball movie and why? That's first. <laughs> okay. And then the second one, what, what are you working on now? Oh, my. Um, I've been kind of touring lately, so I'm, I'm going to put off the second question a little bit. Let's just say there's, there's always stuff going on, so we'll see what kind of... This, this new book kind of down to the last pitch, I feel in some ways they have to select you a little bit. I always have a couple things going, and I got thinking about Kirby Puckett, and this was, in essence, this book was probably the first time I really wrote about like the entire a rise and fall of an American hero a little bit, and in a lot of ways that's Puckett. My favorite baseball movie is Bull Durham, and if you read my book High Heat, you'll find out that, and I love that movie in large, and in some ways because in High Heat, one of the major characters, and I found this guy, I thought he was dead or didn't really exist, but the Nuke Lelouch character is based on a guy named Steve Delkowski who was in the Orioles organization, who you don't know really a lot about because he never made the team. The day he was supposed to go up with the team out of spring training, he, in a sense, tore his elbow ligament, what would be Tommy John surgery now, but this was before it. And it's funny, uh, Steve's gone through a lot of crazy stuff. He was homeless for a while, he was an alcoholic, and he's now back in New Britain, Connecticut, and I remember having a conversation with him at one point, just going through the highlights of the movie, what happens to Nuke, you know. Uh, Nuke hits the mascot, and Steve would go, yeah, I did that. Uh, and another part, Nuke throws one over the backstop and hits the announcers, yeah, yeah, I did that. Another one, Nuke throws one through, it's either a wooden or, you know, wire fence, and. Steve going, yeah, I'd do that, yeah. And then finally, we're just like talking, we're going through this whole checklist. And one reason that there's so many of those stories in there is Ron Shelton, who did Bull Durham, used to be in the Orioles organization a couple years behind Delkowski as an infielder. But finally, Steve goes, hey, Tim, I know something that happened in the movie. It didn't happen to me. And I'm going, what, 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 Steve? And he goes, I never got to date that beautiful woman, meaning Susan Sarandon. <laughs> what else? Go ahead. I've been a kind of a casual baseball fan most all my life. From the Senators, when they moved away, I adopted the Orioles and mm -hmm. finally got to give up on them when the Nationals came back to town. Um, it was game seven of the 91 series that really showed me why I love that game, yeah. because I remember watching that. Both pitchers going nine innings, scoreless. I mean, that just doesn't happen. You know, you, you don't see that anymore. The tension that built pitch by pitch. You had the sense by about the sixth inning there that every single pitch was the entire World Series depended mm -hmm. on it. And there's no other sport that builds that kind of tension. You watch you know, any of these other things, baseball's the only one that does that. Yeah, I totally agree. And you, you, know, you talk to guys who were in those games, and they were saying, I felt my head was going to explode. Because there's a funny story, going back to Harper, and I'm kind of thinking of Bill Buckner a little bit, is um, in that game seven, at one point, they end up loading the bases, the Braves do, against the Twins, and one's an intentional walk that Morris didn't want to do. And I believe this is in the seventh, eighth, something like that. And um, it's before Lonnie Smith gets lost on the base pads. And they end up bases loaded. The Braves have bases loaded, none out. And um, they get the first out where somebody chops one down the first baseline and Herbeck fields it, the first baseman, unassisted, steps on the bag, they got one. And they go out and they're kind of talking about, you know, strategy and such. And Harper, the catcher, is about ready to go behind home plays, about ready to settle down in his crouch. And, and to this day, he can't believe he thought of this. But he said, hang on, they're going to hit another chopper like that. He thought it would go to Herbeck. He's going to throw home to me. You know, I'll get the force here. Then I'm supposed to throw on the first base, and I'm going to put it over Herbeck's head, and I'm going to become the new Bill Buckner. And this is what he's thinking in the middle of this game. And he had to kind of push those thoughts away. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's think of something else, you know, whatever. And here comes the first pitch from Morris, and I believe it's the Sid Bream, who rolls over on a split-finger fastball. But instead of hitting it up to Herbeck, 
It's a chopper. It's a slow ground ball. It goes to Morris. Morris throws, in a sense, to Harper at home. They get the second out. Now here's Harper sliding out, getting ready to throw on the first base, and he almost kind of shot puts the ball, and they get, the, they get out of the inning. They get the double play. But it's amazing when you look at the footage of that because Herbeck has the ball, and he kind of spikes it, like into the AstroTurf. Morris is like, yeah, like that, you know, the way he would get. And all the twins are running off the field, and the last guy come off the field going, oh, my, I can't believe that happened. It was Harper. <laughs> I can't believe I did it right. <laughs> so anyway, time for one more right here. Two questions if you already covered it. Uh, I came in halfway. Sure. But any insider information on that deke play with Lonnie Smith on the base paths? Was, sure. And if you did cover and everybody heard it, that's fine. And then wasn't there one other play where didn't Lemke make some kind of game-saving play up the middle yep. in the eighth or ninth inning and any it's insider all, all information on, on that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Lemke ends up making a great snare of a line drive hit by Knobloch then steps on second for a double play that comes almost the next inning. And then we'll close with poor Lonnie Smith, I guess. Um, much has been made about the fake double play the Twins did. Alani says, if I thought it was a double play, I would have slid in the second. He didn't slide in the second. He lost the ball off the bat pretty much up in that Teflon-covered roof. What people don't realize is there's another, another kind of, um, in a sense, thing of deception going on. It was Dan Gladden, left field for the Twins. You look at the old footage, and Gladden admits to doing it. He takes off running, and he flashes his glove like this real quick that's kind of within Smith's line of vision, like I could catch this. And then he pulls it down and the ball hits off the wall or whatever. And one of the best stories of that play is poor Terry Pendleton, who still believes the Braves should have won, and I, I can't disagree totally with him. He's the one who hit that double that Gladden kind of fakes like he's gonna catch. He pulls in the second. He's looking over at Jimmy Williams, the third base coach for the Braves, ready to give him, a boy, we got the run, we got the first run, maybe the only run we're gonna need, and he's like, looking at Williams and then he notices standing right next to Williams is Lonnie Smith and he's like going what's Lonnie doing there <laughs> and you know they still should have scored but they didn't anyway it was a great series you guys have been a great audience thank you very much thank you.